Okay, welcome back to, um, to the second lecture, to our second class on conquest of the mind. We've been looking at uh, uh, how do we, do we ensure that we um, keep our minds um, well and healthy and stable um, as we go through life. And the first point that we looked off was taking every thought captive. And I, uh, and we have a question by um, Abraham. He asked, with the temptation of Jesus, did he open a door uh, to, the, to the enemy? So the question, I think, what, what is being asked is, you know, what, Jesus was tempted as we are, then why did he even have to go through this? Why did, why did Jesus have to be tempted? And um, uh, and so here's, I, I think I maybe just bring about one or two scriptures as I'm answering this. So when, when we look at uh, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17, I, I'm just picking up that verse and just reading it for us. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17. Um, uh, it says, therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. So it was necessary for Jesus to be in every respect like you and me so that uh, he could be um, our high priest before God since he had also gone through the same temptation and suffering. He's able to help us when we are being tempted so this is something christ wished to be tempted so that you and i could um, be strengthened in our temptation because christ was one without sin and able to to keep away but in order for us as a warning for us that you know all tempted, regardless of how safe or of how holy we feel we are all against temptation. That's what Christ wanted to show as an example to teach us how to battle against that temptation and also to be confident, to, to be in that mercy and to also show us a way out of that temptation. So he permitted that so that you and I could um, so that so number one, so that he could um, uh, he could see us in our temptation, know what we go through, and also give us a way to walk out of it. So that's something that Christ wished and willfully did so that you and I would have an example to follow on how to battle against that temptation and what is it that we do to keep away and to resist the enemy by the word. Abraham, I hope that that answered your question. Yes, madam. Thank you so much, Pastor. Oh, sorry. Was I my my? Uh, could you all hear me? This was yes, ma'am. Yes, ma oh, yeah. yeah. Perfectly audible. Okay, great. All right. Okay, so let's let's move on to. I I think before we we move into this the second and the third point, let's just um, quickly go back to what we were what we were looking at is. Um, uh, anybody would like to, uh, you know, bring up any kind of an example that that you have decided that you know there are there are these thoughts that are there and you know just taking what we learned right now, taking those thoughts to captivity. Anybody wants uh, anything to share? Anyone would like to share anything before we move on? Anyone? Okay. All right. So we, I think we'll, we'll uh, go forward. The next, uh, uh, the next point that we're looking at of when we're conquering the mind is, um, you know, something that we've heard over and over and over again. Uh, it is to renew our minds. It is to come to a place of transforming the mind. So in order to combat or conquer these things in our mind, we need to keep our mind holy. Um, and 
come to a place of constant renewing of it. And uh, I, I just want to, let, let's, let's just look at about, you know, what are our natural minds and what, you know, where is it? But what what is it by default? What what does scripture talk about our minds by default? And for this, I just uh, like to read Romans uh, chapter eight verses um, um, five onwards. Okay, Romans eight verses five onwards. Okay, so I'm just going to read that. If you have your Bibles, you could open that alongside with me to understand what the mind is about and why is it needed that we continually come to a place of renewing it. Okay, uh, Romans 8 verse 5, for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritual minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. So when, we, when we're looking at two of minds here. We're talking about one is the carnal mind and one is the spirit. Uh, the Bible talks about man having a carnal mind till we are a new creation and then we continue to be in a place of progressive, progressively sanctifying that so that we become more and more like Christ. So when you look at these, that, that entire few verses it it gives you a description of what the mind is the carnal mind is a mind that does things that that are in error are have desires that are wrong it is a mind that desires the things of the flesh the things that are carnal the things that are fleshly it is more geared to um to to enjoying things of the world, as it says in uh, in Romans uh, chapter eight, verse five, it says, "For those who live according to the flesh, set their minds on things of the flesh." Uh, so we see that the carnal mind des desires things that are fleshly, desires things that are, are of the world. It talks of how the carnal mind is in enmity with God or enmity with the ways and the thoughts and the desires of God. And it resists all what God has. It resists the ways and the thoughts of God. And it cannot and it does not want to come in subject to what, the, what God's word says or subject to the law of God is. And it says, nor indeed can be. It is not in a place where it can be. The carnal mind is not just in enmity, against God, it cannot be subject, it cannot be made in obedience to the law of God. And that's why we need to have those renewed minds. A carnal mind is a mind that cannot please God, Romans 8 verse 8. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. That is a place, a carnal mind is, is not in a position to please God. A carnal mind it brings about death. Um, we see that in Romans 8 verse 6, it says um, the, the, car, the carnally minded, for to be carnally minded is death, whereas spiritual, being spiritual minded has life and peace. A carnal mind makes a believer indulge in many things that are not of the spirit. It is of a worldly nature. And, and we see that in, in verse uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 3. It says, for where there is envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal, right? And you're behaving like mere men. So this is the description of the mind, of being carnally minded, of being fleshly minded. And so as a believer, we are called to renew our mind. So remember, we did say that uh, when we are saved, we are saved in our spirits, but it requires a renewing of the mind to, to move it from a place of being carnal 
to a place of being renewed. And, and we see that in scripture, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And let's read that uh, um, together. Let's just, let's just read it. I'm just going to pick it up from, uh, from uh, another, uh, um, you know, uh, another translation. And this is again NLT. So it says Romans 12, verse 12, uh, 1 and 2. So dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will accept. When you think of what he has done for you, is this too much to ask? So verse 2, don't copy the behavior, behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. So renewal is, um, a, is what, what it talks about, is changing the way one thinks. It is renewing. It is um, being transformed, being changed in, in entirety in its ideals, in its attitudes, so that, so that you can prove, um, sorry, uh, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will know what God wants you to do, and you will know how good and pleasing and perfect his will really is. So when we are renewing our minds, what we are doing is we are letting go of all that is fleshly, letting go of all that is carnal, the way that we originally carnally think, the thoughts that we have, and having the word of God, taking on God's ways and God's thoughts. Scripture very, very, um, you know, uh, emphatically says in Isaiah 55, 7 to 11, it says the unrighteous man has his, his thoughts and those who are unrighteous or those, the wicked man whose thoughts are unrighteous, let him return to the Lord and God will have mercy on him. And God says in 8, verse 8, the Lord says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth and make it bring forth and bud, then that it may give seed to the path to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth from my, my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please and prosper in the thing which I sent it. So what does it do? So first of all, we understand that, that it, it needs a renewal. And when there is a renewal, what, is it, what does it do? It undergoes a transformation. And how does it, how does our minds, undergo transformation only through the word of God. Our, our thoughts are renewed only through the word of God, being transformed through the word of God. And it, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the notes actually gives you, and it says it undergoes a metamorphosis, metamorphosis, which is it undergoes a complete change. The transformation that is seen like how a caterpillar becomes a butterfly. The kind of renewal that takes place is something that was different. You know, if you, if you look at the way that, uh, that a caterpillar evolves, the pupa is, is, is the way that it is. But then when it is being transformed, it comes out as something beautiful. It comes out as something completely changed and completely transformed which is what Romans 8, 6 is talking, Romans 8, that what we read is talking about, to be having a spirit-filled mind, to be having a spiritual mind is to have a renewed mind, because that's what leads to life and peace. So we are called to live that mind which is renewed. So a renewed mind cannot be seen akin to the carnal mind, because a renewed mind is a mind that is able to keep away every thought that is not in alignment to God's word, or every idea that is not in alignment to the will of God. So a renewed mind is a mind that is being trans that is transformed, that it, that it changes. So what is the 
uh, content of a, what should the content of a renewed mind be. We saw the content of the carnal mind. The content of the carnal mind is death. The content of the carnal mind is is that which does not please God. The content of the carnal mind are those whose thoughts and the ways resist God, who's uh, not subject to what God's word says. It is, it is the carnal mind is that which desires the wrong things. So we see the description of the carnal mind. But what is the description of the renewed mind? For that, let's turn to um, uh, Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. So it says, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, things are lowly, lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. This is what the renewing renewed mind looks like. It is a mind that thinks in accordance to truth, in nobility, in just, in that which is pure, that which is lovely, that which is good report. So all of that is what uh, a renewed mind looks at. And to come to a place of being renewed. And we are called to do that and that's one of the biggest ways of how we learn to conquer our minds is being in a place of renewing the mind. So if, if you look at it in progression, knowing that there are thoughts that you may need to, uh, to bring to captive captivity and in, to the obedience of Christ and then renewing it. Now, you know, a simple way of learning how to renew your mind is number one is to recognize what are these thoughts what are the thoughts that are in disobedience to god so recognizing it and you know the next is to if we could if we could just use a word like either replacing or reframing your thought into god's word into into god's god's thought so recognizing it you know, taking it into captive, okay, and then reframing, reframing those thoughts into what God wants you to think about. So, the uh, earlier on we did that exercise of understanding what are those thoughts that we need to take captive, that we need to pin out, that we need to bring out. Now it is to saying, what can, how can I reframe? How can I replay? How can I renew this by God's word so that? You know, my thoughts are pure, my thoughts are true, my thoughts are worthy, my thought, are, my thought is of good report, okay? So the same thought that you had last, you know, in the last couple of minutes, we, we kind of wrote that down. The same thought that you had, now reframe it, renew it, use God's word to displace something that, that, is, that, is, that is not in obedience to God. So you know, and maybe we just take a couple of minutes to complete that and say, okay, this is what I, I have caught it. I have recognized it. Now I want to replace it. I want to reframe it to renew my mind. So just take maybe three or four minutes um, to maybe write down what is it, what are the words or what are the thoughts that you are going to bring about so that you can continue to renew your mind so that, you know, you have that, um, that experience of transformation as you do that. Okay, a couple of minutes, maybe three, four minutes to do that. <clears throat>
Yes, Christopher, I think you have a question. Uh, yes, Pastor. I just wanted to uh, confirm what exactly you want us to do. Um, so the, the first part was having the thought cap uh, made, uh, having those thoughts made captive. So that would be no. the, the uh, you know, skipping it up, uh, you know, uh, kept, kept, uh, kept no. uh, uh, you know, bound basically. Yeah. And then in this in this stage, we are talking about renewing the mind. So are you talking about um, replacing it with something else? So based on what with, God uh, yes. wants to do? Yes. Yes. Or, uh, how do yes. we do that? I mean, in the sense... Um, scripture. Scripture. So we need to find the scripture? Or? It would be good if you can find scripture to help you to uh, renew that part of, of a thought that you would have. Like, um, let's say the thought is maybe it is about something to do with your with your children okay the thought of uh, maybe they will um uh, i'm telling you that is because uh, that this is something that uh, you know that 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 did come up in a discussion in the morning about um maybe uh, about how they're they're doing or how you know what will come out of their lives and i found a, a you know i i found a scripture saying you know we do not bear our children in um uh, in captivity, but they are called the blessed of the Lord. They are descendants of the Lord, right? So, so just declaring that is renewing your mind. So, if you can find a scripture, that would be wonderful because the Word of God is living and active, and that's what brings about, you know, as as you read in in uh, you know just a couple of verses that it will do what it was sent forth for. It will accomplish what it was sent forth for. So scripture is definitely the place to go. Okay, we'll move on to the last uh, last point that we have here is so we've we've learned about taking the thought our thoughts captive. We've learned about renewing our minds, and now it is to develop a positive mindset. It is to continuously being in a place where you have uh, um, and a positive or an optimistic or a spirit filled mindset now when when you know to 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 understand that god just as much as he's interested in everything in our lives you know the lord is is more than interested in how we think and uh, you know the the verse that talks about in psalm 139 1 and 2 it says you have searched me and known me you know my sitting down, my rising, rising up, and you know my thoughts from far off, right? So, uh, God wants or desires that we have a better attitude or a better lifestyle of thinking, because um, uh, a lot of what we think impacts us, as as we have, as we had spoken about, and uh, you know, when we are when, when we are developing a mindset, but what is a mindset? A mindset is something that you carry throughout. It's not like for position or, or for, uh, uh, you know, pockets of time, but it's something that you carry out. So every time you have thoughts coming to your mind, you're either, you're either building like a, a, a negative, a, a negative, um, empire or you're building a positive empire depending on what are the kind of thoughts that you are engaging in okay so it is to discipline yourself and be in a state of positively always thinking about uh, about things that are that are good and true and noble like we said the renewed renewed mind right things that are good lovely good report noble just all of that so uh, positively using scripture to combat any thought that comes about so this means that you know we we're always 
on alert. We're always in a place of being like a sentry trying to watch out for what those thoughts are. And I think that is that is what we are called to do, to be able to have a mindset, a, a positive mindset. Because in every situation, when we're saying we to build a, dev, a positive mindset, it's not some psychology, uh, pop psychology that throwing up. It is to say that we look at everything through the eyes of God, through the promises of God, through based on who God is. So even in a situation that, that may seem most unlikely positive, we look at it in the way that God has seen it. We look at it that even, um, you know, as uh, Romans 8, 26, I think it says, um, all things work together for good to them that love the Lord. So even at a place where there is something that is negative, we we receive it as, you know, all things will work together for good to them that love the Lord. So, so seeing it in through a positive light and certain examples that we can uh, bring about is, you, you know, in Numbers 13, where the about the 12 spies where Joshua sends about sends the spies um, to go look up the the land of Canaan now all these spies were sent to the to the land and all of them all tw the 12 of them saw the giants right including Joshua and Caleb and the and the rest of the, the 10 um, uh, they saw the giants but 10 of them how did they see it? You know, they saw themselves as grasshoppers before the giants and were immediately, they were immediately frightened. And they immediately said, you know, this is, uh, this is not a place that we should go or we will, we will lose the battle. But, you know, if you look at it interestingly, the other two, Joshua and Caleb, saw the giants as bread that are ready to be eaten. What did they see? They saw victory. So, they had already won the battle uh, the minute that they saw it. So the way that they saw it, the way that they perceived it was one saw it as a problem and the other saw it as, uh, you know, as something that was victory. And they, they began, they saw things as the way God has seen it. So when we, um, when we speak positively, we speak into our lives but when we think negative or when we speak negative we can begin to feel defeated even before we have entered into the place of war or entered into that place of battle so we are to learn to look at things from the point of the way god sees it and another example is um is the way that abraham uh, you know he is called out uh, uh, in, in Genesis 15, he's called out uh, and uh, shown by God. He's, he shows, Abraham shows God and, sorry, God shows Abraham the, the stars and says, you know, look up to the heavens and count the stars and number them. See if you're able to number them. Okay, so what does, uh, what does Abraham do? You know, he goes out and, and God gives him a a picture he gives him something to visualize and uh, he he's he begins to visualize and say and say you know this is as much as what your descendants will be like for a man who didn't even have a son out of uh, out out uh, as a promise right he goes to visualize and he sees the promises of god and he begins to see that as a reality so we are also called to think in the way that god thinks to understand number 1 to see the way that god thinks god the way that god thinks is not small and concealed and little and uh, limited the way that he sees it is huge is big it is it has a lot of details in it it has it has many things in it and that's that's how we are called to think the way that god thinks god also you know if we look in um, uh, jeremiah uh, Mm, Jeremiah 29 level 11 it says God thinks about uh, a good future things that are not yet seen he says that's what's going to come or um, you know at, at the time that he speaks to Abraham um, God's God tells Abraham that you know he he's 
he promises Abraham to bring life into, into a dead situation. And for 25 years, uh, Abraham waits for that promise. So God calls things that, that has never been to come to fruition, to come to an existence. So that's what, that's how we are called to think, to have that sense of a positive attitude, to be able to align all of our thinking to the way God thinks, to align ourselves to the way God, um, God's word says, to align our thinking uh, into maybe visions and dreams and ideas that the Holy Spirit may be, may be bringing into our lives and to completely um, eliminate all that is, that's, that's negative. Because that's the hope that we have been called for. You know, we keeping our hopes alive, the anticipation of what is to come, of knowing that when we have entrusted whatever it is into God's hand, he makes things much greater, much larger for, for us. And, uh, you know, as we, we read that scripture in Ephesians 3.20, it says, he is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that you and I can ask or think according to the power that works in us. So when we are in the midst of his presence, in the midst of that power, the Lord can do much more than what we can ask or think, even better than whatever we can imagine and whatever we can we can think think of. So we are to be completely um, um, strong and completely persuaded in our minds to know that whatever God has uh, has shown to us. That's what we are going to be receiving. Okay, so developing that positive uh, mindset is what we are called to do. So here we've completed um, uh, how do we how do we come to a place of con being at a place of conquering our minds is one taking every thought captive, bringing it to the obedience of Christ, renewing our minds on a regular. Uh, basis with the word of God and developing a healthy mindset by continuously, by keeping our minds and our hopes on seeing things through the lens of God's promises, through God's word. Amen. Okay. Um, we have a good 15 to 20 minutes available for us. Uh, either we can open this up for questions or, or any kind of a sharing um, that maybe things that you have done or, or the way that you have, um, you know, done this in your personal life, I think will really help and encourage one because I have a story which I'd like to bring up and maybe something uh, I'd like it to be open to anybody who'd like to share who's been through this journey or who are uh, in this journey as well. Okay. Yes, Mangi, I think there's a question that you have. Or a share. Yes, Pastor. Uh, see this similar question that I, the what I had earlier, I brought earlier. Um, in many churches, especially in, in black churches and also um, Indian churches, also uh, people put more in, they focus more on like on the de devil, not not like they are focused on the especially on the devil, but also they put more, they give, uh, they cast out devil most of the time. And from what, what we've learned today, is that temptations and temptations, temp temptation begins in us because of what we see, what we think, what we, we hear. And how, my question is how much should we, how much time should we spend on casting out the devil and speaking about the enemy instead of uh, focusing on improving our, our, our souls, our relationship with God and spending time in, in, in prayer? Because I find most of the time it's devil, this devil, that's devil, this devil, that, and then we forget that we've got the responsibility and we can, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Mangi. <clears throat> I think that's a that's a great question. Uh, Mangi's question was: We see that a lot of times we uh, people churches lay a lot of emphasis on the devil, um, on what he does, and casting out 
uh, rather than um, rather than immersing ourselves on building our relationship and ourselves in God. And um, I think there in itself lies the answer. Do not give the devil more importance than he needs. Um, uh, so it says resist the devil. And I would, would say it as, you know, even in the literal sense of it, um, once you have identified maybe things, open doors, um, uh, what we are, um, you know, where we may be engaging in working uh, with the enemy to being able to cast out, to being able to rebuke, uh, to pull down all of his works, that is sufficient there. And to park that and work on building our relationship with God, because it is not so, so I, I think I want to answer this in this way. It's not just about, not only about identifying what the enemy does and, and you know, doing, uh, rebuking, all of that. That is in our authority. That's what we are called to do. But at the same time, we have to still build our muscle, you know, our spiritual muscle. And that happens only when we continue to meditate on God's word, pray, uh, read scripture, come to a place of edifying ourselves, learning from it. It's like this, you know, you go to the, if you, if, if you, you know, take a physical example, uh, when you are faced with, um, uh, let's say, an, uh, let's say some kind of a illness or a disease, right? In order to fight it, yes, you may do all, you know, you may, you may take your medicines and do all of that, but you need to still build your physical self. You need to build stamina, you need to build immunity, you need to build bone structure so that you are stronger to fight a disease that comes about. So you do, don't pay too much attention about skirting the illness but you you pay attention to building yourself up so that you know you're strong your your body learns to fight uh, a, a germ or a, or a bacteria that comes about so similarly uh, identifying recognizing is important but keeping it at its place and not exalting the devil or the say, uh, or the evil one much more than the place that you give the lord we are called to continuously, you know, pray at all. I mean, if, if you look at scripture, there are so many things that say, love the Lord your God at all times, or pray, or love the Lord your God at, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Constantly keep your relationship with God growing. So yes, the focus needs to be that and give the enemy the importance and the focus as it needs. Where it is, where is it? Under your feet and not on the top of your head. So yes, the idea is to build your relationship with God more and more so that uh, you build your immunity, your stamina against the enemy, not that you're spending too much of time figuring out uh, how to how to recognize and keep the enemy at bay. It is when the more that you build, the more that you stay in that, uh, we learned about that, right? Sanctification, when we our healing comes through very naturally sometimes when you're just in the word of God, just uh, meditating, just worshiping, just being in the presence of God in itself builds you up a lot more and gets you stronger. So that's the place where we are called to be. Okay, any other questions or any other thoughts or any sharing? We have 10 minutes more, so if anyone would like to share or bring up any thoughts, you can take this time to do that. If not, uh, we could just close with a word of prayer. Maybe one or two of us 
uh, can pray that, um, you know, God helps us to keep our focus on um, on the way that we... Now, can I share? Yes, Avni, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, Romans 12, 1 and 2 has been, Lord, uh, Lord has been sending this verse very, very often, like probably on daily basis, this comes to me. In every situation, when I find myself struggling and I find that I've actually entertain something that I shouldn't be. And this word comes to me, renew your mind and uh, do not be confirmed to the pattern of the world. Because many times we see that those who are following the pattern of the world, they sound better, <laughs> they look better <laughs> than we who are struggling to walk in the narrow path. And, you know, sometimes we start wondering what is happening, like, and especially like my, my younger one, my daughter, she always says, Mama, why are they not troubled as much as I'm troubled? No, I pray and I'm still troubled and they are not troubled, Mama. They are not following the word of God, but they are all happy and I'm struggling. So I always tell her, read this, Romans 12. The entire chapter is like a beautiful chapter for us to be strengthened, to you know, know that uh, no matter how much we are being tried and tested by the world and by our own self or by devil anywhere, but uh, the final word is from the Lord. And what he has promised through his word, no one can take away our fruit, our portion, our uh, you know inheritance that we have in Christ. So this word has continued. Even today morning, uh, Romans 12, one, uh, I just uh, was talking to my niece and she was asking me something. I said, just I, I don't have time, but you just go and read this Romans 12 and you'll be blessed. <laughs> and after that, you were teaching on it. I was so glad that the Lord has been ministering to me through this word and Especially, mm -hmm. ma'am, you know, um, when we were talking about like temptation, uh, I remember that many times we think in our own strength that we are on the right way and everything is fine with us and we are following God. But, uh, you know, uh, the sanctification, as we have read, is a progressive thing in our life. And God knows, uh, Psalm 139 says, he knows deep inside what is going on. So even I was, you know, thinking of certain uh, a relationship with somebody that uh, it's all okay and it's all going well. But then uh, in the process of sanctification, I came across a, a, a season of my life where I realized that uh, actually it wasn't that good. But uh, I bless God for teaching me through APC, uh, especially not only uh, Bible college, but through the church and uh, all the teachings that we are receiving that by the renewing of my mind and by holding on to the word of God, I've really seen the power of God working in my life. And he has, you know, done that work in me, which I needed to be, you know, be more forgiving, be more uh, rejoicing in the Lord, be, being more uh, experiencing the victories that God gives in our situations where we feel defeated and, uh, you know, delivers us from all kinds of self-pity and, and uh, you know, condemning ourselves, living in guilt and condemnation. So uh, I've seen Lord doing this in my life uh, day after day, day after day, day after day. And uh, it's a joy. It's a joy uh, understanding that what power is there in the word of God. I mean, people keep praying, Lord, humble me, humble me, humble me. But when we say humble me, we do not know what we have to go through, through the refiner's fire to be humble. It's not uh, just a prayer, which, you know, uh, uh, surfacially it is, it looks good to pray that humble me. But when we say humble me, uh, the process is, uh, as, as it says that when you are being disciplined by the Lord, it may not seem good at that point of time, but it will bring you to a place where you will not be ashamed anymore. So uh, personally, I have really been blessed and I understood that what the power word of God carries in our life and how we can hold on to it and truly experience the joy and victory that Jesus has provided on the cross. That's my testimony, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you, Avni, for sharing. That was, that was so wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, so I, I <clears throat> maybe I, I'll also quickly share and then I think we can close. Uh, so something, and so much so in the lines of what Avni was saying about, um, you know, this constant prayer of Lord surrender, you know. Um, uh, when we say surrender, uh, I keep telling myself, 
you've got to be completely clear that when you're saying surrender, it is laying down every right to to yourself. And uh, so when you when you pray the prayer, it's, it's a beautiful prayer to pray. But like Avni was saying, actually going through that place of surrender is is very hard. Yet what comes out as a result of that is so beautiful. And um, so something, uh, so when, when, we, when we're looking at surrender, and I think for, for me personally, when I was looking at surrender, it is surrendering all, um, all of life's decisions uh, that, that we've, I've made, making, and will make. Because there is that sense of, um, um, uh, so maybe we'll bring it out as an example. There are there are certain things that you know. Maybe there are certain decisions you make um, for for your family because you know that that's that's what God would would like you to do. But however, the the kind of um, responses that come can be very very difficult at that point of time so that's that being in that place of surrender is actually completely lifting your hands and saying god i have no right to hold this anymore and i'm willing for you to take it to the extent that you would want to so that it will turn out to be something so beautiful so you know even for decisions that uh, that we've had to make for different um, you know uh, issues within the family sometimes it comes and it comes like condemnation especially when people condemn you for certain decisions you've made maybe it's within the home itself or within the family itself that there are condemning words there are condemning thoughts you know it's because this is something that you did or something that you and you go back to god and say lord um you know this was done, I, I know that, you know, this is as part of your will that we surrendered to this and did this. But coming again, um, that the thoughts, the, the scripture that says Romans 8.1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And that becomes like a repeated, um, uh, you know, word of God that, that, that I had to completely keep telling myself there's no condemnation. Whatever we've done or whatever the decisions we've, we've made is going to come for out for his glory. Maybe you can't see it right now. It's not evident at this time right now, but it will come. It's just looking at the promises of God and saying, Lord, I'm keeping away every kind of condemning thought that's generating within me, that's being generated by the outside, and knowing, Lord, that you will bring to to fruition what you have promised so yeah so that's so much in line with what uh, what you said thank you Avni, for sharing yes louis i think you have you've raised your hand would you would you like to share your thoughts good morning ma'am good morning everyone um please this is not to um, negate what anybody is saying but um is the word surrender the most accurate word we can use considering the fact the bible says we are not ourselves we have been bought by christ so it means that ownership is is, is christ he owns us um, even though sometimes you want to you want to you want to give him the good and take the bad or give him the bad and take the good but he bought he bought us the way we are both good bad ugly everything so is the word surrender the right word to use or allow him be the owner of the property both the divinity, the humanity, and everything. That's that's why I'm trying to see if we can, if it doesn't change the narrative of the discourse. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Um, uh, I do see um, Christopher. You've added a question. I'm going to keep this, and maybe we could we could look at it uh, next week. Proverb um, Romans twelve verse three. Um, we can we can address this next week. I'd keep it as a as a reminder to be addressed next week. So, could would one of you just close with a word of prayer, please? And uh, we could we could end today's session. Ma'am, shall I pray? Go ahead, Rupa. Please go ahead. And before I pray, just a small line to add, ma'am. Uh, 
uh, in the Bible it says we, sh we should humble ourselves. But uh, I went through a course called in image Christ image training. There it is very uh, specifically told we should never pray that God should humble us. <laughs> we should humble ourselves, give us God, ask God to give us the strength to humble ourselves. That is <laughs> that is that just a small addition. That's all, ma'am. I'll pray. Father God, we come to your presence, Lord. We have enjoyed your Father, Spirit of the Living God, pouring out into our hearts your life, the word of life through your servants, Master. Thank you for the teaching we are learning. Father God, please enable us to renew our mind each day as we dwell on your precious word, Lord God. Father, we surrender ourselves, humble ourselves under your mighty hand, O oh Lord. You have a plan and purpose for each one of us, Lord God. Help us to be in tune with your purpose and Father, grant us hearts that trust in your leadership, in your authority, your guidance, your shepherding, to embrace you in all that we do and say and walk, Master. Thank you, Lord. I see uh, Pastor trouble with the small cold. Father, please send forth your word and heal her. Bless her efforts and all that she does for you, Lord. Thank you for making her a blessing to us, Lord God. Thank you for all our classmates that they all stand and learn together. Thank you for this experience, Lord, learning from each other. We thank you, Master, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, ma'am. Amen. Thank you, thank you, Rufa. Thank you for being so sensitive God to what you. you saw. Thank you. God bless all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Bye-bye.